So tonight uh, is the beginning of uh, uh, a four-week series that we're starting, and uh, it, it's going to focus on the whole time of the whole area of marriage in our lives. Now, this is the first time we've done anything like this uh, as a church. Uh, we do a lot of great uh, uh, recordings, and our whole sound team really tackles all of that. Pastor Tom is usually at the helm of sharpening our sword in our digital representation across the world. Amen? Yeah. So uh, tonight, though, we want to take these next four Wednesdays. And uh, the pastors have asked some couples to be guinea—I mean, to be first-time people to join us up here on the stage as we walk through things. And believe it or not, we we uh, coerced Daniel and Gabby to join Linda and I on the first session. And so I just want to ask uh, them to come up, and you guys can take your seat. My lovely wife, Linda, come on up, take your place. So we're excited to be here. We're happy that you chose to be with us. Well, good. So we're going to do this kind of conversational style, if that's okay. And uh, if you have to uh, go to the bathroom, just raise your hand and we'll give you the thumbs up. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> just feel free, you know, to do what you need to do. So, um, but we we tried really hard to um, not make this just something that is conversational uh, in regards to uh, dialogue, but more interaction uh, between uh, our our families and between. So we intentionally not just scripted everything, you know, where I'll say this much and she'll say this much and she'll say. So you'll see some interaction in that uh, as you go through. And uh, we, we really have just been asking the Holy Spirit to do what he wants to do. We want to thank you for uh, joining us. Uh, these sessions, we pray that they are vulnerable, uh, that we are vulnerable, open and honest with the things that God has done in our lives we're sitting amongst many people who have wonderful marriages, right, and, and have just walked through lots of stuff. And so we certainly are not the, the end of, of any of the things that we're discussing. We just want to begin the dialogue. Do you know what I mean? I think we believe that some people get stuck from time to time in their marriage. They only go so far, and all of a sudden, there's just something that they can't get past. And so we think even sitting here with Daniel and Gabby, They've had some wonderful breakthroughs uh, in their marriage, and all of you can agree in seeing their lives and knowing their lives. So we hope to get to just a little bit of that as well. This, uh, this particular session is called Making Jesus the Center. Okay, and so we might all think, well, he's already the center, but we just uh, sometimes uh, we, we take steps believing that the fullness is there and that he is uh, the very the very person that we get all of our hope and help from, but oftentimes I find myself that I'm in the center, and it's not Jesus. <laughs> I'm pleasing myself. I'm I'm doing things that are are helping myself out. I've, I've, what people think about me, uh, taking care of myself over my wife, and uh, so as we spend this time tonight, I'm just gonna ask that the Holy Spirit uh, helps us. So let's pray. Lord, as we begin, we just look to you and we thank you for the work of your Holy Spirit in our life. And we ask that things would become real and things would become tangible for all who are here tonight and those who are watching uh, this time together. So we thank you for your grace now. And Lord, we pray this in Jesus' name. So I'm going to Okay, so this is going to be a grab the microphone back and forth probably. But um, just so you guys know, there, you know, like you see up here, it's a four-week series, okay? So, and the titles are up there. So, And they're, they are in order. Communication and conflict is next uh, week. Or, ne yeah, next week. And then intimacy, sex, and romance. So, yeah, we're going to talk about it. <laughs> and navigating the seasons. So, um, 
So take some notes and write down questions too that you guys might have. And um, do you have that other slide? Write down this number. If you may already have this number in your contacts, because it's what we send um, you guys when we're um, giving you reminders and stuff. So, but if you don't have that number, write it down and um, just text in your uh, your questions. And um, because it might stir, you know, even as you're uh, going through listening. Um, it might stir up some things. So write it down, send it in, or even when you go home, you might be thinking of something. And, and some of your questions may possibly be answered even as you were going through the classes, but they may not be. So, um, so anyway, just jot them down, send them in, and uh, we'll try to have another time to, to go over those with everybody, okay? So hopefully that's so we, we look to these times and, and hope that even in the future we might do just a little bit more. So we want your feedback and we want to hear what that's like. Uh, I just want to start out by saying, I think all of us can recognize that he is our first love. You know, he, he, he's in our lives when he's in our lives, but there was a time that he wasn't. And I just want to have Daniel and Gabby just reflect for a moment in a time when they first started this relationship they have where he wasn't in the center? And what were some of the things that you experienced through that? Well, first off, I'd like to say, um, you know, being able to be here to speak on foundation, I think is awesome because that's like first and foremost thing, you know, you start with, because if you don't have that, then later on in life, you're gonna find yourself going back to basics, you know, having to go back to that foundation anyway. Um, for us, uh, when we first got married, like uh, for for me and well her too, well we didn't have our foundation correct. Um, basically, like I picture it, like if I were to like pour a foundation of a of a slab or something, you know, um, if I were to just form and pour, you know, there's no strength in the middle of it. There's nothing in the middle keeping it together, and uh, that's pretty much like how we how we started out. Um, basically, just formed and poured and and, and had my own things in the middle of the foundation what I was standing on and it wasn't um, wasn't you know backed by Christ it wasn't you know uh, anything solid to stand on um, so like for us um, you know we, we ha I had a lot of weak weak foundations uh, but you know it came around to where I had to what was one uh, well <laughs> uh, you know um, probably anger was one of them um, uh, selfishness you know uh, stuff like that. So I was building a house on something that would crumble, you know, not something that would build up and be strong. Um, but it took having to repent and break up the foundation, you know, and um, and to have God remove that stuff out, so I could put, so I could prepare a foundation proper, like put the rebar, you know, which is to me I picture that as God. Rebar is the God, because because He the strength He holds everything together. And when you pour around that, you know, he's holding your, he's holding all that there, you know. So um, being able to pour a proper foundation and being able to stand on something firm, you know, you could build up from there and you're going to have something that that will withstand storms, you know, something that could uh, could help fight back and, and be sturdy, you know, not not crumble type thing. But. Um, yeah, like Pastor Bob was saying, I mean, I was living like a worldly life. I came from a very abusive household. So all I knew is just, okay, well, in order for people to love you, you got to give something away, you know? So we definitely started backwards. I think we started with a very rocky foundation where there was a lot of anger. There was a lot of jealousy and I'm Hispanic and I was very prideful. And I struggled with it. I was like, well, you're not going to tell me what to do. What do you mean I can't go shopping? Like, I got to ask you for permission. Like, I didn't understand that he was the head of my household, and I had to honor that and not, like, try always. I mean, I would even stand. I remember there was a one time that I literally got on his face, and I'm like, I might be short, but you can't talk to me like that. But it was it was really hard. It was really hard to, to allow him to – I don't want to say control because that wasn't it, but just to even allow him to minister to me or he's like, well, what's upsetting you? And I was like, well, nothing's upsetting me. Just leave me alone. And so it was definitely hard. And I think it wasn't until I had my realness moment with God that I realized, okay, this has to stop. Um, 
So then we started backwards. So we had to really fight for fixing and pouring that foundation like Daniel was saying. So then there's a time when, when Jesus, you know, he's walking, he comes to a famous well, Jacob's well, and he meets a woman there, if you remember. And she'd been coming there. She had had a sordid life. And, and then at that point, she's talking to him and she's and and you know she's talking about how deep the well is and all these things but at one point Jesus said if you would know who it is that's talking to you you would have asked him and he would have given you living water you wouldn't have to come here and do this so what do you think it takes for somebody to actually recognize i need to ask him for help in my marriage you know there's a lot of people who may say we, we've got this under control and all we need is love. But the truth is, it's not all we need. All we need is Jesus in the center. But if we're not in the center, who is? <laughs> oh, I guess I'm answering this. Um, yeah, yeah. If he isn't the center, then usually it's us, right? I, I'm in the center then. And... Um, um, what was the question? <laughs> Besides that, no. Um, so, what does it take to ask Jesus? She said, he said, you need to ask him. Well, yeah, to you know, and, and I even as Gabby and Daniel were talking about this, there does come a point that you have to allow Jesus, you know, you have to open up your heart and let him um, teach you, let him lead you. Um, you, you, there's that point of taking that risk and trusting him. And, you know, as we do that, he, it, I'm, I'm sure that was the case even for, especially for Gabby, because I'm sure coming from an abusive home, you know, where even from the very one that, you know, you should be able to trust, right? And so then to come into a marriage with some of that, um, opening your heart to trust, to really trust again, especially when it might be hard to do that, um, is difficult. But um, I, I, I know in talking with you guys, though, too, that, and I know even in my own life, the more I would do that with the Lord and even, you know, with my husband, the more that track record gets built up, you know, where, especially with the Lord, though, you know, when we choose to trust him, he is faithful and he shows himself faithful time and time and time again. So it makes us think again, God, why would I withhold myself from you when um, you are always good, you are always faithful and you are trustworthy? And um, so, you know, I was thinking, though, even for you, Daniel, um, even as Gabby was being healed, um, and, you know, that must have affected you sometimes, too. And so what did you do in those times, you know, when maybe it was hard and you didn't know quite, you know, how to be the husband that she needed? And um, so that was just a question for you. Yeah, and uh, I didn't. <laughs> there was, you know, I didn't know what to do because, um, you know, we were 18, 19 years old, and yeah, and uh, you know, we had had a lot to deal with. Um, but one thing that helped us a lot was was my dad. Um, always having someone to go to, you know, when you when you really can't figure stuff out. A lot of times, someone on the outside can point it out to you. Um, we went to Bill Cook a lot, you know, the counseling and stuff, and and really seeking that help really got to help me, you know, from people who've experienced it, people who've walked through it, you know, it's really helped me kind of get back on track where I needed to go so I could be the husband I need to be for her. Um, I mean, it was tough because sometimes I wouldn't know how to react, you know, because she would just start breaking down crying or, um, and, you know, if I've, I never went through that stuff, so it wasn't like something I knew how to uh, respond to, you know, but, um, but luckily, you know, there's men in the in the house that have and that knew how to uh, direct, 
you know, for that path and um, just seeking them out and seeking that wisdom from them, uh, being able to draw that in and being able to, you know, be the better husband and, and know how to react to those things. You know, like sometimes it's just they just need help. You know, they just need hugged. You know, they don't always need to know why or you don't always need to fix something. Sometimes it's just being there for them, hugging them and, and just being there, you know, for them. You know, we, we recognize that, that he is our first love. And to the degree that he comes to the center and that we allow him to love us is really the well then that we dip from and we give to our wife, we give to our husband. If people are hesitant to trust him, they're always going to be hesitant to trust each other. In the marriage, if if I don't know that I can lean on Jesus, or if I've if I've stepped out and done something in my own strength, or I'm going to take care of this, and then it doesn't have the 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 whole grace behind it that God brings when we trust Him, but it was in my own strength, and she's not going to build trust. But if I'm leaning upon the Lord, it's something that will always cause her to then want to take that next step of vulnerability, vulnerability and and honesty. So, Gabby, what was some of the first steps of honesty with Jesus when you were coming out of things that were very hard? Um, I think just, I, I don't know how to explain it, but one of the things that I didn't struggle with, and I know sometimes people are like, well, I'm just, I, it's just hard to give it to Jesus. But I think because I was so broken, and I just found my, sourcing Jesus and he just became really real for me I think I was just super willing like my heart was just willing just God just take it just take it and in the midst of all that he was healing me and walking me through through all the stuff that he was um and it was really hard to focus on not just myself and trying to heal and then I had one kid and then I had the other kid while I'm trying to heal everything and and then trying to let him in because, yes, I was trusting the Lord that he was healing me and walking me through all those things. But now he's like, you need to trust men because I had a major trust issue with men. And it's like, okay, well, I trust you, God, and I know you're healing me. But now you're asking me to trust him. Like, how am I going to do that? So those were really hard to do. But I think just being, and that's all God is always asking, is just be a willing heart. Be a willing vessel. And even though it was painful to walk through all those things and stuff like that and just um, allow him to come in and expose things that I honestly didn't remember. There was a lot of stuff that God was just revealing to me. And it's like, well, this happened and that happened. It wasn't, it wasn't like a pity me thing that, oh my goodness, I can't believe that happened. But it's more like, oh my goodness, like he loves me so much that he's wanting to restore those things and make me new. Because when we're born, we're, we're, we're born to the family that we're, we're, that we're in. And one thing that God showed me is like, yeah, that's not the life I chose, but your parents chose that life. So they made their decision to not walk with me. So that's why all those things happen. So then I had to learn to forgive, honestly forgive, not just say, hey, I'm going to forgive them, but really feel it. And that was a whole nother thing that I had to walk through. Um, and then after that, it just, it just became easier I think for my healing, but then the marriage part was like a whole another thing, foundation that I work on. So God was working on my foundation with him first because he wanted to clean me out from all those things and then start focusing on, on our marriage. You know, um, thinking about you guys, but thinking about most of us when, we're, when we start marriage, it's kind of like, you know, I know for me, I was probably really idealistic, you know, like, this is just going to be heaven, and he's so wonderful, and and he's not like anybody I've ever met before, and, um, you know, even I'm sure even for Gabby and Daniel, sometimes, right, we go into it like, he's going to rescue me from my family, and he's going to, you know, we're going to have this great relationship, and so we kind of, we really do have this idea of what marriage is going to be, and, um, and lots of times we, we don't realize that, like Daniel was saying, there's going to be storms, there's, it's going to, there's going to be some hard times, and, you know, because you're taking God is taking two imperfect people 
you know, and he's bringing them together. And, um, you know, so because of that, we're going to be rubbing one another. And the Bible talks about iron sharpens iron. And he really does want to put us together to refine us and, and to honestly, you know, and, and I have to say, you know, even being married to Bob, we've been married 35 years. How long have you guys been married? Seven. Wow. So, you know, through that time, there's always growing, you know, but um, I have to say God has used, you know, of course, out of everybody in my life, God has probably used him the most to help me learn and to grow. And, but, but I have learned one thing that I have learned. um, And like Daniel said, it's because of God putting people in our lives to teach us and, and to help mentor us and disciple us um, is that um, we, we often tend to make our spouses an idol in our lives. You know, we, we think that they are going to fulfill us. Being married is going to fulfill us and, and um, having a family and it's all just going to be, you know, and so we put our hope in those things and even kind of like what we were singing in worship, all my hope Lord is in you. Well, we sing that, but it's another thing to really do that, you know, um, because what do we do and where do we go when our spouses don't quite, you know, they've hurt us. Um, they haven't measured up to what we thought, you know, I, 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 I didn't know you were like that. <laughs> I didn't, what? Can I re- she said, can I return you? <laughs> But, um, you know, and so um, what, where do we go when those things happen? And I think that really shows us, too, where, what, what are we really putting our trust in? You know, it's got to be in something greater than me, even greater than my spouse. It's, it really can only be in Jesus. So he has to be our first love, you know, he just has to be, or we're just not going to, Daniel, that was a great picture, you know, if that rebar is not there, there is no strength for that building, you know, if God is not the center, you know, you think of rebar, it's sticking up but, or around, and the cement is all around that, and, you know, he is that strength in our lives. So we just can't do it without him. And so we've got to really sometimes examine, God, am I putting too much expectation, too much hope, too much, um, you know, uh, in him? Because he's going to fail, right? And then what do we do? Then what do we do? We cry again. (laughs) And the whole whole point about... um, our pastors are telling us always be in the word. They're telling us to pray. They're telling us to be in church because the health, the personal health of your walk with Jesus is what's going to determine the health of your marriage. It'll determine the health of every relationship that you have. You watch somebody that's going through rejection uh, or, or fear. What will, what will come out of that always when you get around them is things they're afraid of or how they've been hurt things that have disappointed them. And so that you'll end up walking away with a cup of those things uh, at the end of that conversation. But the person who has said, Jesus, I may feel rejected. She may have misunderstood me, or she may be knowing the whole truth, and I feel bad about that, right? Either one of those extremes could have happened, but I'm not going to the rejection cup and drinking that all by myself and then thinking that, you know, that's going to make me better. But when I feel those things, if Jesus is really the center, and, and, and I want to get to a point, because if he's really the center, then you go to not rejection. You go to acceptance. You begin to say, Lord, you made her for me. You created her. Maybe what I'm seeing right now isn't very encouraging, but who she really is in Christ is really encouraging, and that's what I've drank from all of these years so that's what i'm going to remember and then we overcome so gabby tell us a little bit um about that place uh, because i think it's so important about vulnerability and honesty overcoming lies 
right? You know, you shared a little bit with us before about this issue of lies, and, you know, they keep coming. You are this. You walk through this. All those things that we hear. How did you overcome the things of the past that kept wanting to push him out of your future? Well, I don't know if you guys have been to 7-Eleven. You see that big old jumbo cup that I think Daniel spends like 5 $6 for. That was how big my rejection was, like the jumbo costco size cup. And anytime Daniel would tell me something, I would automatically take it as a rejection or I'm offended, like how dare you offend me and stuff. But um, one of the things that really God had to convict, and honestly I feel that because I focused on um, really building my foundation in Christ. I feel like the Holy Spirit is quick to correct. So at the beginning of a marriage, okay, he never stepped out on me or anything like that. But I would always hear the enemy, oh, he's checking out this girl, or like this and that. She's got no babies and she's super tiny and all this and that. So the enemy's like lying to you, like this girl's prettier and this and that. And he wasn't even doing, he, I don't even know, he was probably looking at the sky for all I know. Like he was not even looking at anyone. So, but there goes the enemy trying to lie to you, and I would stay awake, like, all night. And I was mad at him, and he didn't even know it. So there, here, I'm trying to pick a fight, and he's like, why are you mad about it? It's like, I didn't even know I got you upset or whatever. And I remember one night, I was really mad at him, and I could not even tell you. Like, honestly, guys, when you get in a fight, do you really remember what you fought about? No, I don't remember what I fought about. I was like, I just know I'm mad at you. So he literally got home. And I don't even know what it was that he got me upset about. And he went straight to bed. He took a shower, this and that. And, was, and then the enemy goes, look at him. He is just laying there. He's not going to apologize. He doesn't care about you. And I was all like, oh, how dare he? Like, I was boiling inside. And I was so mad. And then I was like, fine. I am not going to sleep here. I got up and went to the living room. And I'm trying to lay down and sleep. And God's like, go back to bed. I was like, nope, not going to do that. I'm mad at him. He didn't apologize. And this and that. He's like, he doesn't even know why you're mad. So I got up because God wouldn't leave me alone. He's like, you need to go back to bed. Because that was one thing that we always talked about. We said, we're never going to go to bed angry or we're never going to sleep apart and all that stuff. We've never, ever have slept in separate rooms at all, ever. I don't care how mad he's got me. We're there. Um, but that, that, that night, I wanted to be like, no, I want him to get up and apologize. And God's like, no, go back to bed. So I went back to bed, and I'm laying there by myself, and Daniel's all knocked out, and God's like, hug him. And I was like, no, I'm not going to hug him. He doesn't deserve my hugs. And then, um, so I hugged him, and the minute I hugged him, guys, something broke. So the enemy just tries to cause division over and over again. He doesn't care what you fought about. He doesn't care. He doesn't even know that your husband's not even mad at you because he doesn't even know what it's about. So he's just trying to cause division. So one of the things that I always have to remember, and I think what our pastors have said it, he's not your enemy. He's not trying to go after you. He's not trying to attack you. He's your spouse. God has given you to him and stuff. So that's one thing that, that helps me is the conviction of the Holy Spirit of really trying to make sure that we don't cause more division because the enemy, what does he do? Come, still kill, and destroy, right? So he's always causing division for things. So one thing that we've tried to do is, um, well, actually for me, what I try to do is I try not to take offense to everything because I, from the beginning, I've always been, you know, taking offense over everything. And that's something that I had to really pray against and really allow God to really heal me in that place. And it was honestly really hard because I'd rather just be mad at him than say, okay, I was wrong. You know, I don't want to say that I was wrong. I want him to say he was wrong. But um, that never helps. So, That's good. That's good. When we get married, uh, you know, well, before we get married, we, we take a shower. You know, we look like Daniel. We're all combed out. You know, we have on our nice clothes. And then we show up at the door and we, hi, you know, and we're so affectionate. We're so encouraging. Well, not too affectionate because their dad always sat right there. Uh, when I showed up, but what, a little bit when he wasn't looking. <laughs> but there was that there was that place where you wanted to give your best, and so when we talk about bringing Jesus to the center, He always gives His best to us. He always loves us. He forgives us. He's He's quick to encourage us. He's telling us who we are before we ever get to that place of really being that person. So. But when we go out dating and we spend all this time, to Linda's point about expectation, we do have a, uh, a suitcase when we're dating. 
we're carrying it around. And that suitcase looks really good on the outside. You know, it's got nice buckles and it's got leather all around and it looks like it's a little bit worn, but not too worn. You know what I mean? But then when you get into the marriage, you all sit at your table and you start opening your suitcases. And then your spouse starts looking inside and starts asking questions about what's inside. And then is that really you? Is that who you really are? And, and, and something that I just want to touch on tonight is that that's not who you really are. All the things you've walked through, all the things that you've grew up with, the things that you did that were apart from Christ, they're in that suitcase. And if your spouse looks in there and says, that's who you are, and, and continually then struggles with the image of that instead of the image of who Jesus is in the center of your life, it's going to be difficult. I'm going to ask uh, Linda to respond to this too. But when we were going, th when we were, when we would go through fights, she had a real godly mom uh, in the whole process to Daniel's point about who are you going to. When we would go through fights and, uh, you know, I'm one of these guys, if I get offended, I'm, I don't need to talk to you. I, I can just go and not say anything and go on, you know, and then she was pretty good at that too. So we would not talk to each other. We would do the not talking, the not talking thing, and we would glare at each other once in a while and keep going. But then it always killed me because then she would go read her Bible. Then she would go and pray. And then she would go talk to her mother. But I want to tell you what, when she would go talk to her mother, and I'm going to let her respond to that, her mom would defend me. Her mom would talk about how God's working on this man. And nine times out of ten, she would come back and she would want to talk it through. And then she would want to and she'd want to ask, uh, and she'd want to ask me, how can we settle this? So what is it that your mom told you? <laughs> you are <laughs> no. No, she she would talk about, you know, how she knew that. I think she would always try to bring us back to the truth that we were on the same team, you know, and um, he's not my enemy, as we've kind of been saying, because it really is easy to to see that when they've said something, and we know how to push those buttons with each other, you know, that um, I'm hurt, so I know what to say that's going to get at you, and um, so sometimes then we're, we're fighting like we're enemies, and... Um, so she would usually, you know, remind me that, you know, he he really is, he really loves you. He really does love you. And and so it was a reminder that, okay, we're we're struggling with this issue right now, but we're gonna get through this. Is so she would always, you know, bring that hope, which is sometimes all that we need is um, just those reminders that, wait a minute, God is for you. God is behind this marriage. He put you together, and you are for one another, you know. Um, you chose each other, and, um, you know, you're going to get through this. And so she would always rem bring me back to those things about remembering. And I think we need to do this oftentimes, remembering um, God's faithfulness to, to help us through times before, and he's going to get us through this. And, and to, to remember, even like Bob was saying earlier, who he really is beyond just the last thing that he said, you know, this is who I, what I know he is. I know I know Bob loves Jesus, you know, and, and I know I can trust Jesus to teach him in the ways that, you know, because we're not supposed to be the teachers, and lots of times I think as women especially we want to teach them, you know, we want to tell them what they should be doing or, or not doing, and even in the Lord, and, and I, you know, we need to release that, and so I think she would just remind me to trust the Lord to work in him. Your job is to love him and to forgive, you know, and she would bring me back to the qualities in Christ that um, if we really want to be like Christ, right, this is what we do. We forgive, we keep loving unconditionally, not just when 
he's making me feel good and then I'm going to love him and I'm going to respond. But if he doesn't, I'm going to go to my corner <laughs> and he's going to go to his corner. But so, so I would come back and we would just try to talk through and forgive, you know. I often, you know, just, who apologized first? No. We both, we both sometimes did, and, um, and uh, just humble ourselves. Sometimes we just got to humble ourselves and just say, you know, forgive me um, for responding like I did, and I know that hurt you. And I could, you know, we could sometimes say, but you hurt me first, and you said this, and I wouldn't have done this if you hadn't done this, and just play, th play the blame game. That's what happened with Adam and Eve, right? And the devil's always wanting to divide us from the very beginning. God's always wanting to push us into one another, into one another, just like we need to press into him. He wants us to press into one another and work through it. So that's what she would make me do. So last thoughts are <clears throat> we, we read what love is in 1 Corinthians 13. One of those, if I could highlight to Linda's point, is that we don't take into an account a wrong suffered. That means we don't write it down and remember it over and over. I, Linda's always been one of those people, and she would come and repent first almost every time. She's humble, so she's not going to tell you that. But it would be her brokenness that would come and cross the line first. She wouldn't bring then the things that I did wrong. She would bring the things that she knew were true in Christ. And that was what she set on the table for our discussion. So oftentimes when I was didn't, when I in my pride didn't want to repent, I thought I was right. Um, and then what happens is the devil has a whole list of things that they've done in the past. And this is another one of those times that they're just reinforcing who they really are. And that's the devil's voice. And so when all of a sudden she would come with humility, she would come with love, it would kill me. I wanted to fight still. I wanted to be angry. I wanted her to feel bad like I feel bad. But she wouldn't do that. She would go talk about Jesus. She would go talk about uh, forgiveness and, and and this can work and you know we we should get past and there was all these things the, and then the worst thing she would do she'd go worship in the back bedroom play the guitar and she was like she was like herself just remembering who she is in Christ and so I want to encourage all of you that are here when you get to that place where where you know you know this is not who we are as a couple fight to get to the other side because one of the things that when we opened suitcases, hers was full of hopes and promises and notes that she wrote to herself about what kind of husband she wanted. And, and it was all silk lined and it was just a beautiful <laughs> idea of marriage. And, and then she opened mine. Talk about your fixer upper, <laughs> right? She would look and, and, uh, and so the devil then would take her on a journey and say, but do you know where he's been, what he's done? His heart wasn't yours first. All of these things. And so when we talk about someone who had to just overcome knowing what was in the suitcase and deciding to believe that's not who I am, change me. It, it, it's one of those things that a husband just looks and says, wow, that's what I admire wife. Not, not someone who is questioning, am I really there yet? But I'm, she's looking at maybe two out of 10 places that I need to be and saying, that's what I'm going to focus on today. There's these other eight things I could focus on in the marriage that aren't very good. But she's going to focus on the two. And that's what you bring back to the table. So I want to encourage you that that's what we see in Daniel and Gabby. We see a determination to be and see Jesus in that other person before you see their past or their pride or their faults or all these other things. And so we just want you guys to uh, share as we close this one important thing for everybody, and then we're just going to close in prayer.
go first. You're the closer. You're the closer. Um, I think one of the things that really stuck out to be able to make the marriage work, because there's many times that I would just be like, I'm not throwing the towel. I can't. I can't do this anymore. I don't want to fight. I don't want to argue. God was just telling me, just like Pastor Bob was saying, focus on the positive. And I had to get that negative thinking out of my mind and stop battling with it. And I'm like, okay, he took the trash out. Yes, it wasn't when I said it might have been really late at night, but guess what? He took the trash out, right? Sometimes, um, I don't know, I do that. I'm like, hey, can you go do this? Can you go do that? And I want it done now because I have other things I'm worried about. But it's like the fact is that he took it out. So I had to stop focusing on all the negative that he wasn't doing right then and there and just focusing on like, hey, I appreciate you fix this. I appreciate that you fix that. And one of the things, too, that um, God had to get in my heart at is that I had to stop complaining that he wasn't the man that I wanted him to be because my mental expectation of what I wanted for him was not who God was calling him to be. So I had to start praying and say, God, okay, let my husband be the man that he needs to be, that you know he needs to be for me. Not my expectations. And we're really real with our kids. I'm like, what you see on TV, that is not real. Okay, you're not going to have rainbows and sunshines. Like, we argue in front of the kids. We teach them how to say, I'm sorry. We teach them how to, like, how to resolve conflict and all that kind of stuff. So um, I'm thankful that my kids didn't get to see the big blow-ups that we do. Like, now we we still argue every every now and then and stuff. But it's teaching them how to how to do it in a loving way without always being against each other. Um, so that's one thing I could encourage you guys with is really um, focus on on who God wants them to be, not what we want from them and expect from them. And that even changed on me because I'm like, well, I didn't know that's the kind of man that I wanted, somebody that's always going to be willing to pray for me or somebody that's going to call me out and say, hey, I think something's bothering you. I think there's like some spiritual stuff that you're working on. I was like, okay, well, if I wasn't looking for that and that's not what I was praying for, I wouldn't have the man that I have now that's willing and able to carry me through a lot of the stuff that I'm walking through in any season and even encourage our kids that this is the kind of man you're going to want to carry your future household. Uh, for me, it was uh, realizing at a point that I had to change a lot of things. Um, so at a point of realizing I had to break down foundations that I have put up that, you know, weren't structurally sound um, to build up our house for the marriage. A lot of times I had to just repent and go back to the back to basics and break down that old foundation and and really put God back at center and really start pouring that foundation so I could be the husband she needs to she she wants. Um, and, and honestly, that's what it comes back down to. Um, yeah, for like, yeah. For the most part, that's that's what I had to notice was it was me. I was I was the I had to change my heart, myself, my foundation, my atmosphere before you know I could start building up with our our relationship, our marriage, um, to really get something positive out of it. So um, I just wanted to um, share this. You know, it's a popular uh, scripture, and it, and it is good for even beginning this whole series, but um, so uh, in Ephesians 5, you know, there's a whole section there where it talks about marriage, and and um, I'll go ahead and just read it in Ephesians 5, and it's verse 22. Wives, submit to your own husbands as to the Lord, for the husband is head of the wife, as also Christ is head of the church, and he is the Savior of the body. Therefore, just as the church is subject to Christ, so let the wives be to their own husbands in everything. Husbands, love your wives just as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for her, that he might sanctify and cleanse her with the washing of water by the word, presenting her to himself a glorious church. And it goes on. But I just, you know, somebody once I heard uh, pose the question, you know, why did God put you together? And, um, you know, and I thought about that, and sometimes I think we don't begin marriage with that. You know, it's just, I just love you, and you love me, and let's get married. <laughs> but God has a purpose for the marriage. And, and I think when we go into it like that, I think we tend to fight for it a little bit more. And, and I believe God's main purpose for any marriage 
is to be a reflection. It's to be an example of how Jesus loves us how he loves his bride, which is us. And he, it says he, he loved the church and gave himself for her. So it's really saying, God, my life is not my own. You know, my life, and I was thinking of Galatians 2.20, and you can jot that down, but, um, you know, my life is not my own. You know, I've been crucified with Christ. It's no longer I who live anymore. If we're making Jesus the center, it's not about me anymore. And, um, but, you know, um, been crucified with Christ. It's no longer I who live. Christ lives in me. And the life that I live now, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me. So first, like Bob was saying, we've got to know we're loved. And, and then it's in giving. You know, love is not just receiving. Love is really, if we want to, you know, love like Christ, it's all in the giving. It's an action. So we really do need to say, God, this is all about you. You know, I, I am so blessed that you loved me. I had this picture of Mary and Joseph, not to tell a, a Christmas story, but Mary and Joseph, you know, I just love that here they are single and God visits Joseph and he visits Mary and it just is a picture right there that first individually they're making Jesus their Lord that's why he was able to come to them and that's why they were able to hear him because they were spending time with him so he was the center of their own lives individually separately then God brings them together. Then God speaks to both of them when they're together. And, you know, as after they're married, tells them, no, you need to leave and go this way now. And, you know, and then, um, but then he, he speaks to just Joseph at that point when they're married. And Mary, you know, follows because she knows she can trust that, that Joseph was hearing the Lord and he had that habit of hearing the Lord and following. And so then she could trust him so God could speak to him and she could trust that. So there's just a whole thing of first and foremost, before we even get married, but even after we're married, we've got to keep developing that relationship with the Lord because there's going to come a time where we can't depend on our spouse. You know, we can't just, and I don't want to say can't depend on him, but we can't, um, we, he can't fill all of that for us. Only there's that void in all of us that only Christ can fill. And there came that point where Joseph was no longer around early on. And Mary continued, though, she continued walking with Jesus. So, God puts us together, and it's a wonderful picture for, for those that are around us. And like you guys said, for your kids, you know, I'm so grateful that you guys pushed through and didn't, you know, just settle for an identity. Like even Joseph and Mary, you know, they had a child that the world would look at and say was illegitimate, you know, and they could have walked around with this identity, you know, but they they didn't. They chose to believe what God said. And you guys have chosen to believe what God says. And because of that, God is blessing you and your marriage. And, and as a result, other people are getting blessed, even as you're ministering to other people and you're ministering to the next generation. And so I just love you guys. And um, I'm so blessed and encouraged that you are such a, a great example. Not that we're perfect, right? Not that we've arrived, but um, you're continuing on to pursue Jesus and make him your passion. And because of that, your marriage is getting stronger and stronger, and you're being a real blessing to people that are around you, and you're fulfilling the purpose of God for your marriage. <laughs> Amen. Wonderful words. Just as we finish our time, um, we hope that it's, it's something that you can go away with and build on in your life. Marriage is one of the hardest things that you will ever do. If you're considering getting married, make sure Jesus is the center first. 
we meet with couples and the pastors would agree that unrealized hopes and expectations and unrealistic uh, ideas about who this person is are usually the first three years. And rather than the person that I want to know is the person that they're becoming in Jesus. And uh, rather than who it is that, what it is that I think I'm going to need. And so I want to ask you to do something maybe very practical. You can go to Home Depot. You can go anywhere. You can get a wooden stake as a couple and go pick it out together. Maybe you're married. Maybe you're going to get married. And then you go to the Word of God and you, you write on there Galatians 2.20. What was it? I've been crucified with Christ. You want me to say the whole thing? It is no longer I who live, but Christ lives in me. And the life that I live now, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. And so what you do is you write that out on that stake as a couple. You know, you take turns writing different words in that. And then you go someplace in your yard. You can get a pot of dirt if you live in an apartment. You don't have a yard. And then what you do is you take and you drive that down into the ground. And sometimes when you feel like, where are we going and how are we going to get through another day? You walk out there and then you just kneel down in that spot and say, it's not I who live, but Christ lives in me. And watch what happens. If you can remain angry, if you can remember the whole list of things that that crummy husband that you have isn't. But, you know, it's, it's, it's not I who live, but it's Christ who lives in him. And, and I'm going to keep believing that God's going to change him and he's going to help him. And, uh, and that's what I'm going to set my hope on in this marriage. And be his biggest cheerleader as God's doing that by faith, right? By faith, because you may not see it now, but you can by faith say it's coming and I'm cheering you on. I'm going to tell you what a wonderful man you are, how handsome you are. You are the sexiest man on the planet. <laughs> and on that note, we got to go, folks. <laughs> so, no, keep going. No. <laughs> All right, everyone, we're just grateful. If you, if you, uh, if you could do, bless us uh, on that uh, text message that you can send in, if you could send a message in that says, I put the stake down. There's some marriages that are here, and I'm even looking over here that some are, that are coming. If you could write that scripture out, Galatians 2.20, and maybe you're a young person that's thinking, well, I don't even know about all this, and you say, when I get married, I want this to be the foundation of my marriage. And then you, you find a place and you take your, your spouse to be one day and you walk out there and you say, we listened to a marriage one time and, I, and this is what I drove in the ground to, hoping and, and praying that my marriage will become. I know God will meet you there and you'll find that that'll help you pass many, many discouraging times. So I'm just going to let Linda close in prayer and uh, we're going to bless the Lord. So one thing uh, when Bob was, uh, Pastor Bob was talking about, you know, Christ being the center, one thing that I was remembering was like when Gabby and I didn't have Christ in the center, it was so easy to want to give up and just so easy to make the decision to, um, you know, just to divorce was the easy option. You know, giving up was the easy option. When we put Christ in the center, fighting for a marriage was then an easy option. You know, wanting to, to move forward, wanting to push through finding having some place to come to the center to you know we're not looking into ourselves for options for, or for answers we're now looking into the word looking into christ for answers so it's a lot easier to uh come together and, and fight for a marriage with him centered versus with him out being centered so yeah. Father, we just thank you for this time that we could be together. God, we know this is just the beginning. You have so much more that you're going to impart to us, so much wisdom and gold nuggets for us to, to take with us. And so, God, I, I just want to bless everyone that would hear. I pray that they would keep looking into your word for more, that, God, you would lead us by your spirit um, to keep sowing into our marriages, God, that we would, um, you said, promised in your word that we would reap a harvest if we didn't give up 
And so, God, I pray that you would in, instill hope again for those that are struggling and, God, a, a renewed desire in those who are just beginning to put you first, to plant seeds into their marriage, to pray into it, to, to speak words of truth into it. Um, God, your miracle working power, God, we, we release it into the soil of every marriage, God, of those that are listening and those that will be listening. God, we, we declare by faith, God, that you have caused these marriages, you have called them to, to not just exist, but to thrive and to bring forth a harvest, God. And so, Father, I just pray again. Lord, help us to sow seeds of faith, seeds that of truth, God, your word, Lord, that we would just keep planting and keep planting and keep praying into those things, watering those seeds, Lord, because we know if we don't give up, God, we're going to reap a harvest. And it's all in your timing, God. We're going to trust you all along the way, God, because you are the one that brings the growth and you are the one that brings forth the harvest. So be glorified, God, in our marriages, we pray, God. Let this all be about you and for you. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 Thank you for coming. Uh, our ushers will be in the back if you have your tithe or offering tonight. And uh, please tell somebody about these times and uh, join us week after week and just watch it build and let God put those foundation blocks in your life. The Lord bless you. We'll look forward to seeing you all on Sunday. Have a wonderful night. Thanks for coming.